This is not the Hunger Games I remember. Meet Can't Miss Evershot. Yes, I I'm serious. She's about to take a shot at a birdie when Dale pulls up. She misses, but hits this guy. Talk about popping his bubble. Or should I say balloon, because <laughs> he's in a hot air balloon. <laughs> Dale and Can't Miss sit and chat. He's brought her some bread, but in fact, it's a rock. Then, they discuss the upcoming Starving Games, a televised event in which a random selectee from every district is set to fight to the last man, or women, or they, a quality moment, is left standing. So, Battle Royale, before it was cool. Dale really doesn't want to go. He can't leave his grandma behind. As you can see, she's a little worse for wear. As far as can't miss, she's got a little sister to take care of. Suddenly, speakers call out for all citizens to meet up for selection day. As the pair head over, we learn that, truthfully, no one wants to be drafted in the starving games. So much so, that many even injured themselves so they can't be entered. Look at the top of this man's head. District 12 is home to many people, but little food. Driving some to eat their own arms. It's real tough out here. The cows don't even make milk. Sadly, not even magic can save the day. Canmus meets up with her sister Petunia and their lovely mother. Uh, moving on. At the selection ceremony, we watch a presentation about their president, Mr. Snowballs. As a kid, he clapped his own mom. As an adult, he started a blog that gives away the endings of movies without warning. Wait a minute, that does me. Anyway, he is the most terrible man alive. No really, just look. He proceeds to give a brief history on why the Starving Games was created. It all started when President Snowballs was faced with a serious crisis. How to keep citizens in check after the destruction of society from social media, TV, and memes. Oh, and not to mention that Lady Gaga became president, which explains why they wear these kooky outfits today. The answer was simple. Create something that would keep people focused on what really matters, like old ham, a coupon for Subway, and a half-eaten pickle. Inspired by Japanese movies, President Snowballs devised the starving games. And yes, that's what you get for winning it. After all, who doesn't love half-eaten pickles? Time to get to picking. Crazy hair lady reaches for a name. It's Hugh Janus. The crowd begins to giggle. Next up, Phil Mahooters. Classic. Last but not least, Dean Goldberry. Could anyone turn around and check for a Dean Goldberry? <laughs> okay, for real this time, Petunia Evershot is picked. Can't miss his sister. Oh no. However, can't miss immediately erupts with joy. She didn't get picked. Heck yeah, my dudes. After a couple chest bumps with the security guys, Petunia begins to cry. She hits big sis with the puppy dog eyes and she can't help but volunteer. Shockingly, as soon as Can't Miss does, Petunia drops the act. Those were fake tears. At least Can't Miss isn't alone. Another citizen volunteers, Peta Malarkey. Truth is, he's got a thing for Can't Miss, so he'll follow her to the games. Time for goodbyes. Can't Miss says farewell to Petunia and assures her their mom will take care of her. Are you sure about that? We cut to President Snowballs and the manager of the games, Selica. As we can see, he has the Nike logo etched into his beard. Very cool. Mr. President sternly tells Selica that he wants everything to go well with this year's games. He would hate it if some underdog with exceptional archery skills and a trademark single braid hairdo somehow inspired the masses to rise up and revolt. Ha, <laughs> that couldn't happen. All right, let's see some other contestants. We got Marco, District 1's beefcake. High five. Oh, oh okay. Meanwhile, Can't Miss is backstage all nervous. Her fashion designer pulls up and gives her some encouraging words until he realizes he's got the wrong girl. He thought she was Stephanie from District 3. He backs away, ashamed. Next on stage is Peta. The first thing they ask him is if he's got anyone special in his life. He does. And that person is beautiful, smart, and cheeked up. Can't Miss looks on with joy in her eyes. He must be talking about her. Turns out, he's talking about Marco. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. After, he goes backstage and Canmus gives him a piece of her mind and foot. It's an especially uncomfortable predicament given her toes, but he assures her he's just trying to make an alliance. Okay, next up is Canmus. She shows off her new dress with a spin. It even catches on fire, which means she's on fire. Eh, at least the ground is loving it. Fast forward to the game's opening. The contestants all stand patiently on booby-trapped platforms. If you step off, you go kaboom. Fortunately, we have these dancing dudes to demonstrate. And with that, the games begin. Chaos breaks out. Peta can do nothing more than scream and run away. Can't miss, on the other hand, patiently waits for an opportunity. When she spots one, she breaks out into a full sprint and manages to grab onto a bag. But so has this girl. Unfortunately for her, she also takes a dagger in the back. Despite this, she continues steadfast in her resolve. How about one to the neck? No matter, tis but a scratch. Okay, surely this chainsaw will cut her spirit. There we go. Can't miss runs off of the bag. 
but then the girl hops on. Well, what's left of her anyway? With a shove, she's gone for good and can't miss takes off. However, she's being chased. But by whom? Oh, the camera crew. Right. Watch out. Parkour. The camera crew falls to the dismay of President Snowballs. Onlookers wonder who this brass young girl from District 12 is. Then we catch back up with her people who are ever excited to be on TV. Back to the games, let's see how the scoreboard looks. A lot alive and a lot not alive. Celica, now sporting the McDonald's logo, decides to spice things up for Cat Miss. He hits her with a hologram tree, but it's only a minor inconvenience. How about some fireballs? Just look at those blockbuster effects. The fire is closing in and Cat Miss has nowhere to run. Maybe something in the bag could help. Oh, fire extinguisher. Perfect. Catmus expertly extinguishes the fire while the onlookers cheer. Celica is running out of options. It's time for the latest and greatest in technological warfare. Suddenly, an angry bird falls out of the sky and bonks Catmus. Trust me, this was peak technology in 2013. The crowd of elites is loving it. But that's not all. A watermelon falls from the sky. Catmus knows just what to do. She whips out a katana and begins slicing away, fruit ninja style. She easily gets a high score, but there's still trouble looming. One of the fruits survived, and it's a rather annoying type of orange. I'm glad those days are over, and so is Canmus. From all of humanity, thank you. Back on the run, Canmus hears voices from behind. Other competitors. She desperately hops onto a tree and climbs to no avail. If only there was a- Oh. Canmus hides from the group that closes in. It's Marco, his buddies, and Peta. Oh, the betrayal. Suddenly, the group spots something that they're eager to break apart. Canmus trembles in fear. However, what they spotted was a piñata. They break it open and find Alyssa's treats. However, the joyous moment is cut short when they actually spot Can't Miss this time. Uh-oh. Marco launches a spear straight up but misses Can't Miss. Looks like he can miss. <laughs> then, the spear falls back down and impales this dude. Because why not? The moment was so spectacular, it's deemed kill of the day. Brought to you by BetLife. Because life is precious. This is not a real sponsor. Without any other way to get Can't Miss, uh, well, besides this bow and arrow this girl has, the group decides to sit and wait it out. She's gotta come down sometime, right? While chilling, Can't Miss calls out to the birds, and they reply. Sorta. Then, this girl calls out from an adjacent tree. Can't Miss is surprised and also now thankfully glean. The girl signals Can't Miss to look up. There's a hive of bees. Oh, she wants her to quietly knock them down. Okay, okay. Can't Miss proceeds to, uh, conjure up a chainsaw. The group wakes up alarmed, but their worries are short-lived. The hive ends up falling on Can't Miss's head, and then she falls. Also, the group ends up succumbing to the bees and runs away. Can't Miss removes the hive and begins to trip out. She looks up and witnesses a double rainbow. Whoa, man. Now, it's a quadruple rainbow. Taste the rainbow. She looks down and finds her hands turning blue. Now, she's a Navi, and she's got a Navi buddy. Jellyfish start to surround the pair. The man explains that they're soul keepers. Can't Miss panics. You're not keeping my soul. She swats them away until they're all down. Then, the man explains they keep the souls of their ancestors. How could you? That one was his sister. He also reveals that they are a proud alien race created by James Cameron, a man with all the money in the world. Then, they, uh, connect hair braids. Enough of that. The little girl from earlier, I think her name is Rue, slaps Cadmus back to reality. And then another one, for good measure. Rue comes up with a plan. She'll set a fire to distract Marco, then Cadmus will pick them off with a bow. Never mind. Marco is standing right next to them. The pair split off as they chase after Can't Miss. Concerned and outnumbered, Can't Miss goes full Sherlock Holmes, analyzing everyone's weaknesses. She attacks with questionable punches and kicks. As far as this girl, acne cream ought to calm her down. With all the foes bested, only Marco remains. He pounces on Can't Miss with a knife. He raises it. District 12 is shocked and the elites are at the edge of their seats. Suddenly, a whistle goes off. Is that a referee? Oh, it's halftime. We get some cheerleaders, an interview, District 12 copying that merch, and all around having a blast. Whoa, even President Snowballs has can't miss fever. Back on the field, she and Marco rest up and joke about the moment he nearly clapped her. Alright, back to the action. They assume their previous positions and can't miss braises for the inevitable. But then, Rue pulls up and kicks Marco in the shin. It's highly effective. In retaliation, he picks her up and yeets her with a powerful punt. While Marco is distracted, Canmus arms herself and he's forced to run away. Then, she checks up on Rue. She's not doing too well. The little girl asks her to sing for her. Canmus begins, but really, she wanted Taylor Swift. Oh, there she is. She sings the girl to sleep, permanently. Rue has died, due to death. 
The citizens of District 12 become enraged by this. The elites can't keep treating them like this, using them for their sick games. As a riot is about to break out, an ad for a delicious meal pops up. It just keeps getting more and more yummy. Mmm, absolutely delicious. The plebes are now placated. We cut to Celica, who now rocks the iconic Starbucks logo. He informs Snowballs of the civil unrest. The president recommends giving the people more action, like a romance plotline. Celica agrees. He'll try to spark a flame between Catmus and Peta. Catmus gets wind of a rule change by way of announcement. There can now be two winners. Oh, great. So Marco and Peter are going to team up to take her out. Never mind. The announcement further specifies that the winners must be of opposite genders. Oh, Catmus likes that. She'll get together with Marco and they can get poor Peta out of the picture. But the announcement chimes in again, pleading with Canmus to go with Peta, because that's the storyline that was written. Fair enough. She runs off to find him and hears his voice, but can't see him. He used his skills as a baker to disguise himself, but where is he? Oh, I think he's in the gag. The two head off to a cave for shelter. It's pretty cold, so Canmus whips out a snuggie and a heated blanket for Peta, or not. As the night progresses, Peta opens up about his feelings. He reveals he's even been collecting Canmus's hair and using it to create dolls and illustrations of their future family. Wholesome. Peter complains about his hunger, that along with the cold, and he's not doing so well. Canmus makes him feel better with a kiss, but Celica looks on with disappointment. He sends over a drone and says he's going to need to see some more for this plotline. Ah yes, the plot, which we will skip over. Just know that Dale is livid, so much so that he walks all the way over to the studio, beats up the guards, and arms himself. Meanwhile, Peter and Canmus look for Marco. Where could he be? They take turns going in circles for a bit, then prepare for a final face-off. Then, Celica decides to spice things up. He calls in the big guns. The trio is terrified as an unknown group marches forward. Wait a second, Sylvester Stallone? Arnold? Bruce Willis? Incredible. Or should I say, the Expendables. They fire, but the trio doesn't seem to get hurt. Turns out, the gunshots came from behind. They came from Dale. Camus runs over and the two bicker before Dale decides he's gonna switch his Facebook status to single. Brutal. Back to business, Marco holds Pete a hostage while Camus carefully reaches for an arrow. Eh, that'll do. She fires and as her name implies, doesn't miss. With just Pete and Camus standing, there is suddenly another rule change. Again, there can now only be one winner. Pete suggests they both eat these forever sleep berries to protest against the cruel games. Without a winner, they can show the elites whose boss and Camus just sniped him. Beautiful. Her skills don't go unnoticed as soon a familiar group of faces appear. The Avengers. After an astounding win, they would love to have her on the team, but Hawkeye is feeling a little jealous. Nick Fury tells him to pipe down and reminds him that there will never be a Hawkeye standalone movie. Moral of the story? I have no idea.